file server. And now I will share my screen again. Uh, I'm Jack Monstow. I'm the uh, team leader of RoboTutor. Very proud of this uh, one of a kind sweatshirt. That's a uh, gift from my, my uh, one of our two daughters. And I'd like to talk about um, essentially what we learned from X Prize. And I'll explain in a moment what X Prize was. This is joint work with a number of other people. This is the title slide from our presentation at the Learning at Scale uh, conference in, in 2020. But there's lots of other stuff that I'll squeeze in here and there. So how many of you are familiar with the XPRIZE uh, by show of hands? Okay, I'm getting, thank uh, you, I'm getting one thumbs up from Friedland. Okay, oh, and another from Mike. All right, well, in case you forgot or didn't know, uh, the X Prize was a $15 million worldwide competition sponsored by the X Prize Foundation to address the shortage of teachers in developing countries by challenging the participants to develop an open source Android tablet app to teach basic literacy and numeracy to children in developing countries with little or no access to schools. And 198 teams from 40 countries uh, registered back in 2015. It got winnowed down to five finalists by various hurdles. And really the centerpiece of this competition was uh, a massive controlled evaluation of the five finalists, comparing the literacy and numeracy uh, learning gains against a control group of that just had uh, business as usual. So that controlled study lasted 15 months, involved over 2,000 children, and was conducted in 168 uh, villages in Tanzania. And the finalists were uh, had each won a million dollars uh, to become finalists, and they were competing for the grand prize of $10 million, which was going to go to whichever app or the team that developed the app achieved the highest total learning gains provided they significantly outgained the control group. At least one of the uh, judges did not expect anybody to qualify. And the judges uh, did not pick the winner. The data picked the winners, but the judges had to make decisions like whether there was a tie, which it turned out there was. Anyhow, uh, let me go ahead. Let's see. So speaking of villages, this is just some of the people who contributed to RoboTutor, which has benefited from at least 180, uh, almost all volunteers, students, some from Carnegie Mellon, some from other universities in the United States, some from other universities elsewhere in the world. Uh, most of them students, some of them faculty or, or staff or, or whatever. And that's just some of them who, who could fit on the slide. And let's see, I'm just going to move, uh, there we go, okay. So a quarter of a billion children today have no school and many children in developing countries go to school for years, but they can't read. So what if technology could enable every child on the planet to learn basic literacy and numeracy as a platform for further education? Uh, that could be truly life-changing. So here's an overview of the rest of the talk. I'm gonna start with six assumptions that are commonly made in education technology that are broken in the setting of developing countries. And then uh, summarize two studies. One of them uh, analyzed which children of these over 2000 children uh, outgained which others and, and why. And then study two is gonna focus on RoboTutor analyzing the detailed log data that was um, logged by it. Uh, I'd like to conclude in time for questions. And if we do really well in time, uh, I have a, uh, a live demo that uh, I can squeeze in. That said, I love questions. So don't be shy about asking some. So what are those common assumptions? I'm gonna just list them here and then illustrate each one uh, in a little bit more detail. So 
electric power is reliable. And let's see. Xpice and, and the uh, finalist teams had to address these assumptions or work around them. So the workaround for electrical power in places that don't have it is to use batteries. But of course, you need to be able to recharge the batteries. So XPRIZE provided solar powered recharging stations, which you can see one of being installed here in order to provide uh, power for uh, battery charging, also local Wi-Fi and an FTP server, uh, all of that being provided by XPRIZE to work around this broken assumption that they would already be available. The villages lacked internet access. Some of them didn't even have electricity. And I, I don't know how many because finalists were forbidden to enter the region of Tanzania where the uh, study was, was done. So we will never know which villages they were. But the village, they lacked internet access. And so the apps had to work without it. And here you see uh, somebody using uh, a tablet app. Um, this is probably one of the, the village mamas who were in charge of the kind of local uh, looking after the lap, after the tablets. The tablets had Wi-Fi only when while they were recharging. So they had uh, the apps had to work uh, even when they're out of Wi-Fi range. And obviously they couldn't depend on internet access. Many tablet or mobile apps require, they're tethered to the internet. They require internet access all the time. Uh, for example, the weather app on my phone that tells me whether I have time to go on my morning bicycle ride before it starts raining in 26 minutes, it's raining all day today, is something that requires internet access. Here, one of the, uh, Village Mamas is connecting one of the tablets to the solar charging station. So we're used to assuming that um, computers are personal, powerful, and plentiful. That is not to the case in developing countries. XPRIZE addressed the shortage of computers by getting Google to donate 8,000 rather powerful Pixel C Android tablets. Um, they said 8,000 because at that point they were figuring there'd be 4,000 kids and 100% rate of breakage, loss, and theft. Interestingly, it turned out that theft was uh, apparently not a problem. There were two tablets were stolen, at least when they first reported to us the initial deployment. One of them was returned because in that society, a tablet sticks out like a sore thumb. It's not something you would normally see. Breakage was a problem, um, a frequent cause being children breaking the screen with a rock to find out where the voice was coming from because they had never seen touchscreen devices. What blew my mind was some children had never even seen a mirror. That just boggled my mind. So XPRIZE was able to get all these Android tablets, but the RoboTutor team could certainly not afford to provide a tablet for every kid. So we needed a workaround that would enable kids to share tablets, but keep their data straight. So we developed software that they could use to enroll and log in without knowing how to read or write and would not, without uh, relying on a literate adult either. And let me see. Yep, uh, I'm going to play a video, brief video now twice, that illustrates a bunch of things. And one of the first things you'll see, actually not the first, yeah, I think you will, is the, the girl logging in. Uh, so I'll, I'll play it twice and comment as we go along so you can see what you're seeing. It goes by fast. Um, can you hear the video okay? No. It's faint, but it's okay. Thank you, Kaifa. 
Okay. So this is the logging in. And now, okay. Right, so this is just the, the login enrollment. So let me just play that again. Um, so she taps there. Uh, up comes this gallery of photos of kids from when they enrolled. When they enroll, it prompts them uh, what to do if they haven't used it before. It records a three second selfie video, um, which you'll see play. And it says, is, if this is you, tap here. So let me just play that part. So that's, the, so that's the three second selfie video she recorded when she enrolled. And the Swahili prompt there saying, if this is you tap here, indicating that um, green smiley face with a, a what we call rubble finger. It's a cultural convention if something highlights then you're invited to tap on it. If you haven't grown up with that cultural convention, you wouldn't know to do that. So instead we had an animation of a very simple animation of a finger tapping to show where to tap and also to show how to tap. Uh, children weren't used to tapping. So some of them would uh, rest their palms on the screen, which of course is, wreaks havoc in a multi-touch tablet um, or press real hard. So tap gently with one finger as part of the uh, uh, instructions that we had to give them. And then it uh, gets, gets started. The other um, thing is if we go back to the beginning, here, let me, I don't know if you can tell here, but next to each picture is an animal picture. Um, you might even be able to tell that the pictures uh, suffer from either backlighting, so the face is silhouetted like here or here or low light conditions. So uh, extensive on-site user testing showed that surprise, surprise, the children were in fact not skilled photographers. So we could not rely on their pictures being distinguishable. So we also had them pick an animal that they would see next to their, uh, their picture because we knew that those were visually uh, distinguishable. Also, uh, there are other problems. Some of the kids were very soft-spoken uh, or intimidated about saying anything in the presence of an adult. The, uh, the funniest problem we encountered though was they loved taking those video selfies. So in an earlier version of this thing, they kept re-enrolling, which defeated the purpose of keeping their data separate. And after a lot of head scratching, we redesigned um, a face login is what we call this thing, so that they could take what I call recreational selfies, even if they had already enrolled, just when they logged in just so that they would not have an incentive to re-enroll. Uh, another broken assumption is that sensors are numerous and reliable. Now, the only sensor that we had other than, of course, uh, the touchscreen was speech recognition. Uh, RoboTube used speech recognition as a sensor to listen to children read, but it had limited accuracy. So as workarounds, RoboTutor provided fallbacks. For example, uh, after rejecting, a, uh, I'll, I'll play a video in a moment. Uh, after rejecting a word the second time, it would just supply the word. You can see when a word gets rejected because it turns red. Also, the child could just tap uh, for help and it would, uh, you'll see an audio icon that shows up as the prompt to do that. In fact, it's, uh, this is the audio icon. There's the word turn red. And that was also a workaround in the event of a problem with speech recognition. So here is a video of this child over here reading aloud. Uh, let's see. 
Tafadhali sema hadithi kwa sauti. Sisi na kunguru walikuwa marafiki sana hapo awali awali ingawaje ingawaje tabia zao zilikuwa zilikuwa tofauti sana kwa njia nyingine nyingine sisi na kunguru walikuwa marafiki sana hapo awali ingawaje tabia zao zilikuwa tofauti sana kwa njia nyingine as you can see robo tutor then reads a fluent very expressive narration of the sentence aloud highlighting each word as it goes along because a child who reads that haltingly may not have the cognitive headroom left over from identifying the words to comprehend what they've just read so simply reading uh, the sentence to them scaffolds uh, reading comprehension finally In regular classrooms, there's technical support uh, from the teacher, and we could not rely on there being a teacher there, let alone a teacher with technical skills. So as a workaround for technical support, um, RoboTutor used spoken prompts to tell what to do, but it also had short video tutorials to show how to operate it. So here is an example of such a tutorial. This is Filippo, who uh, comes from Tanzania, was working on his graduate degree at University of Ohio in education technology. So he had ideal skills. Kama umewahi kutumia RoboTutor kabla, fanya hivi. So you're showing how to operate If you see your picture, if you don't see your picture, tap on that. I so I will tap on it. Tap on it. Tap on it. Tap on on it. Tap on it. Tap on Tap on Kama huyu si wewe, tafadhali gusa hapa. Huyu ni mimi, sasa ni gusa hapa. So I'll tap there. Hebu tuanze. Let's get started. And then RoboTutor proper starts. Ungependa kufanya nini? And uh, prompts him to, to pick an activity. And let's see, I think I... I have another picture that I actually showed at the beginning of, of the sequence. There's support that teachers provide technical support, but also educational support uh, that we couldn't rely on. So RoboTutor used automated assessment for placement and promotion. That is to determine what level a new student should start out and when to advance them to the next uh, activity. So, uh, now I want to move on to the data that was collected for the studies that I will report. There's test score data. A company in Tanzania called Data Vision International uh, collected demographic data uh, and they administered the elementary grade reading assessment and elementary grade math assessment before and after the uh, 15 month studies. Those are international not exactly exams, I would call them exam recipes because they're not language specific. They specify the form of the items to, uh, for the different subtests to, to test uh, different reading, writing, and numeracy skills. And something called RTI International uh, crunched that data to calculate the pre and post test scores in reading, writing, and numeracy. We got 25% of that uh, data from XPRIZE. That's the largest 
they negotiated that, it, I guess for anonymity or privacy or whatever, they agreed not to give all the data identified by village. So we had 100% of the data with which village it was from uh, omitted and 75% of the data where we knew which village it was. Seven children died over the course of this 15 month study, which is of course very sad. And UNESCO um, in partnership with Dar es Salaam University was missing socio-emotional data for 8% uh, of the kids, at least according to the 75% data that we had. Uh, this, I'll say a little bit more about the, uh, this data, but it's collected uh, at baseline that is before the study, in the middle of it, and at the, uh, at the end line uh, after the 15 months. Okay, so the first study is who gained more? And the headline news here is that the treatment group, that is the, the kids who used one of the five finalists, outgained the control by a lot. Uh, I should explain that um, there was a control group of 30 villages and each of the five finalists was used in a separate group, 20 to 30 villages. Uh, and they were separated to avoid kind of bleed through cross-contamination between conditions. The villages were remote. So this graph here shows the pretest scores of the treatment group and the control group, which you can see are almost the same. And the red part here is the gains, learning gains uh, from pretest to post-test by the treatment group and here by the control group. And the gains of the treatment group on average were in the neighborhood three times the gains made by the control group. Uh, for those of you who know what effect sizes are, that's an effect size of 0.82. If effect sizes that large on any sort of standardized measure as opposed to experiment or defined measures is just staggering. And as I said, at least one of the judges uh, didn't expect any of the finalists to significantly outgain the control treatment. However, the gains varied a lot. So uh, this graph here shows the pretest score against the post-test score. So uh, this is the control group in blue, the treatment group in red, and being above that line means having a post-test score greater than the pretest, as say positive learning gains. And being uh, below, actually I should have said uh, this line here, the, the uh, 45 degree line. Being below it means negative gains because there is some noise in, in testing. So we wanted to try to understand why did some kids, kids gain so much more than others? Because since something like half the kids, even the treatment group gained, had very low or, or zero or negative gains, um, there's potential for lots of improvement if we could figure out why and do something about it. So to study that question, we wanted to see what variables that we had uh, available to us predicted the gains. So here are some candidate predictors. Well, the first one is treatment, whether they were in the tutor or the control group. Then there are the social emotional assessments by uh, UNESCO. And I'll show you what the prompts were for how they get that data. There's a pretest score on the uh, reading and math assessment. The, those were added together to get a total score. And then there's some demographic data collected by XPRIZE, gender, age, village size, uh, schooling, whether the kids had had any schooling, and parental education, education of parent and of uh, somebody else in the, in the house. So those were what we had. Um, and here are the prompts for the socio-emotional uh, survey. So each of these was just one question on the survey that UNESCO administered. Aspirations is what do you want to be when you grow up? Honesty, uh, these other things, character habits, whatever. There was a single prompt describing the situation and asking what you would do. So 
honestly, in a situation where you're alone at home, you break something or do something without being noticed, will you report to your parents or relatives when they are back? The coding for this, there was, um, they were coded as honest or not honest, uh, depending on whether they said deny or keep quiet even if you're asked. So those would be no. Uh, or say it's something else, but so, so that would be no. Uh, admit it and apologize would be yes. And then there's a category called other. So for each of these prompts, there was a, a coding that said uh, whether to say that they had this, this uh, trait or not. And I assume by now you've all silently read uh, what the other prompts were. So I should have a drum roll here. Which of these variables predicted the gains? Well, not too surprisingly, uh, there's a whopping difference between treatment and none. So having one of the finalists uh, versus none. Interestingly, the aspirations were significant. We coded them as literate or non-literate depending on what they wanted to be when they grew up with something that would require uh, some degree of education. So that was subjective and, and ad hoc, but it came out significant. So this is, uh, this, uh, the way you interpret the percent is these kids, if you think of 1% uh, on the test as one point, treatment was worth 13 points, but aspirations was worth a, a, around a quarter as much as treatment which is impressive. And honesty was, uh, was almost as much. We have no idea what to make of, of that predictor. Finally, pretest, uh, pretest was a very strong predictor post-test. Pretest was a very weak predictor, significant but weak predictor of gains. So what this meant is each additional point on the pretest was worth like an eighth of a point on the post-test. So it's statistically reliable because of the sample size, but very slight. What's also interesting is what's not here. Gender was not a significant predictor. The girls gained as much as boys. This is a, a big deal in developing countries where girls often uh, get short shrift. In fact, after they handed out the tablets, they discovered a big discrepancy in how many boys got tablets versus how many girls. So they handed out additional tablets uh, to the girls who were shortchanged. <clears throat> we have log data from them, but this was after the, uh, the pre-testing. So um, the girls data is underrepresented in the results that I showed you. These results, by the way, we adjusted for the false discovery rate since we were looking at 15 predictors. So this is to control for multiple comparisons, not of subgroups, but of, of measures. And so even after this adjustment, the, the treatment was a significant 0.001, aspirations at 0.01, honestly pretested 0.05. All right, so now here's a one slide introduction to RoboTutor. So in a slide, it has content for a bunch of different skills. These skills here for literacy and for numeracy. For each of those things, it has different levels of difficulty. And it has um, a dozen or, or so types of activities. So if you take the cross product of these things, it translates to having thousands of different activities. And the basic cycle of the interaction, when a session starts, RoboTutor offers activities at the child's level. The kid picks the activity and starts doing it and may or may not complete the activity. Uh, they can also back out of the activity. Uh, either way, RoboTutor adjusts its estimate of their level based on their performance. And then the cycle repeats until the child exits or RoboTutor crashes or times out. Well, it doesn't really time out. Um, so the battery could run out and then it would crash. So that was uh, just an introduction to RoboTutor. What were we able to tell by looking at its detailed logs? So we added measures of usage uh, as predictors. 
and in slightly more detail, a session RoboTutor, which lasts from when the kid launches to when uh, they exit uh, or crash, has a sequence of activities, as I mentioned. Each activity has a sequence of items or problems. Each problem has a sequence of steps. Most of them are just one step. For each step, there's a sequence of attempts, and an attempt can be correct or incorrect. So this is sort of the hierarchical structure of the interaction with RoboTutor. And we wanted to know, could, if we looked at an activity and the particular subtests that it was targeting, that is the particular skills, like syllables or letters um, or writing or numbers or arithmetic, was there correlation? So here's some actual uh, Swahili items uh, from syllables where the task here was uh, to read the syllable aloud, familiar words and uh, addition. Uh, this is level one addition, meaning single digit, level two addition, meaning uh, two digit. The measures that we used of uh, usage uh, were successfully finer grained. So the number of items completed, the number of attempts they made, and the number of correct attempts. And then we reject, we regress their post, so there's gains against those measures of usage. Now, we had a problem with attrition. For one thing, we were looking just at the usage during the last three months. The teams got two opportunities to upgrade the software after the initially deployed version. So uh, we called the first update code drop one, the second drop update code drop two. We improved the logging uh, as well as adding activities. So we were looking at the code drop two. And by that point, um, uh, many of the children had stopped using RoboTutor, which is quite normal. Right, so 28% of the kids after a year had stopped using RoboTutor. Ah, we were relying on the logged serial numbers of the tablets to identify kids and the timestamps to identify times. It turned out that the Pixel C tablet has a nasty habit. When the battery runs out and then gets recharged, and it restarts after recharging the battery, it resets the clock to December 31st, 1999. And that plagued the majority of the timestamps. So we did know when the data was uploaded, but we couldn't rely, uh, and we could rely on the timestamps within a log file, but not as an absolute time. So that limited what we could do. There was a high crash rate. Uh, over a third of the sessions crashed. After the thing ended, it turned out that 97% of the crashes were due to a single simple bug that we fixed. But of course, by then it was too late. Also, 2% of the logs were just missing. So the way we got the logs is the tablets uh, connected by Wi-Fi to the village FTP server and FTP the logs there. And then once a week, uh, XPy staff, field staff, uh, visited each village to make sure everything was going okay. And I call it milking the machines. They harvested the data by copying all of the data from the uh, servers onto a portable disk drive, which then they dispatched to via motorcycle, which is how people get around in Tanzania, to a place that had um, internet access and could upload them. So somewhere in that food chain, most probably in the first step of um, FTPing to the FTP server, 2% uh, of the logs uh, didn't make it. We had realized that during, uh, by looking at the data from code drop one, so code drop two, I started serially number, numbering the logs uh, so that I could actually figure out which logs were missing. Okay, so we use three models to analyze the effect of activity usage on test scores. But this sample was limited to the 166 kids who were still using RoboTutor after 12 months. If we also restricted the kids for whom we had complete socio-emotional uh, data, 
it would limit to 138. Since the results were the same, we, we didn't analyze the socio-emotional predictors for just the RoboTutor data. We had done it for the, it, uh, the entire set of kids that, at the results that I, I showed before, but we don't have them specifically for RoboTutor. So we use this model one to take advantage of larger sample size since adding the socio-emotional variables made no difference. Okay, so the table shows the results that were significant after adjusting for false discovery rate of less than 5%. So notice that reading familiar words and subtracting two digit positive numbers were positive predictors, sorry, these here were positive predictors of test score gains, but total events were actually negative predictors. So we cautiously interpret that that um, there may be an actual harmful effect of wrong answers. They may crystallize incorrect understanding, but it could also be a sample skew effect. So uh, take that with a grain of salt. These results here, we don't really believe. Uh, we think it's uh, due to very sparse data because there are very few kids who could do word problems, if I recall correctly. Um, the paper uh, in Learning at Scale has some other results and more about the limitations um, and suggestions for future studies. Uh, especially data we wish that x prize had collected that would have been very useful to know primarily, well, let's see, maybe I'll have a slide about it. So conclusions, the x prize was a very bold experiment to test tablet tutors in developing countries. x prize runs multiple competitions. This was four firsts. It was the first one they did in Africa, the first one they did that involved education, the first one they did that uh, was for software, and the first one they did that required open source. So they really wanted a community of cooperating entrants, even though we were competing against each other. And a condition of the competition was that if you made it to the finals, you had to release your code open source and content. The result was uh, very encouraging. At, we didn't know this at the time. x had predicted 90% chance that this whole thing would fail because there's so many things to go wrong. Instead, it was a smashing success. All five of the finalists significantly outgained the control group. And as I said, by a factor of like three. But why did the gains vary so much? So first study, study one that looked at all the teams, literate aspirations and, and also honesty were significant predictors. We also looked at parental education. One of our colleagues said, the kids at that age don't know which occupations require literacy, but take a look at their educational level with their parents or uh, siblings, other people in the household. Surprisingly to us, we, we thought, oh, okay, literate aspirations is gonna go away. Parental education is gonna turn out to be where the action is, but it wasn't. They were, it was not a significant predictor. So not quite sure what to make of this, except that perhaps um, that the sort of education or family background that encourages occupations that the parents know require literacy uh, motivates the kids, but that's pure speculation. Also no gender effect. So good news, boys and girls benefit equally. It's not surprising that the number of correct attempts was a positive predictor, but uh, the negative effect for the number of incorrect attempts, we don't know whether that was just a skew towards slower learner or whether they actually had uh, a negative effect. If that's so, then it could be worthwhile to modify RoboTutor to prevent incorrect attempts or at least uh, reduce the number of them. The limitations of these studies leave a lot of room for future work. The socio-emotional measures from UNESCO are limited uh, to what they, UNESCO collected. Um, and again, those traits were just based on a single item on the, uh, on the survey. 
By the way, UNESCO did that study to find out whether there were significant effects of the tutor usage on any of those emotional measures. And the answer is no. There's no significant effect um, when we analyzed that data. The UNESCO study itself did not report statistical reliability. It had qualitative analyses uh, and it compared percentages, but it didn't do any statistical analysis of uh, significance. So future studies, if there are any, should collect richer data on the context of use to help understand things. We would love to know why did kids start using RoboTutor on any given day? Why did they stop using it? Why did they complete some activities? Why didn't they complete others? What else was going on in their lives or their response to the software or social context that might have affected um, those things? The leader of one of the t uh, teams that tied for first, uh, the day after the, the um, award ceremony, there is a, a meeting of the finalists and, and other people. And she said something very moving. XPRIZE has spectacular photographs. And the poster for this competition was one boy sitting in the wilderness with a tablet. Turns out that was very unrepresentative. What this team leader reported was that the children used uh, their tablets in groups. And here's the part that really got to me. They called it Shuli Tableti, tablet school. They so much wanted to go to school that they that's how they thought of using the tablets. And one of the students on the project did some field research to find out the interactions between kids, how they help each other um, when, they're, when they're using RoboTutor at the, uh, she did that at beta sites or one of them. Anyhow, we looked at learning gains just at the usage data from a single finalist, namely RoboTutor in just the last three months. We're now starting to look at code drop one, which is uh, gonna, I think, roughly triple the amount of usage data and include the kids who had dropped out before the last three months. So maybe that will reveal some additional things. We're also looking at finer grained analyses of learning curves for individual items, uh, not just these coarse grained skills that were measured by the pre and post tests. And we've been working on applying various machine learning methods to figure out how to improve engagement and learning in Bubble Tutor. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'll be very happy to uh, take questions and... Uh... Good, good, good. Thanks, Jack. Um, that was a very engaging and an inspiring talk. Um, and I, I would like to particularly thank you again in the name of the European Association for Technology Enhanced Learning and in the name of my institute, the Institute of Educational Technology and the OpenTel group that you could be here with us today and, and share insights into your exciting research.